Welcome to Law Subscribed. This is your dedicated news source for all things subscriptions in the law. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney, and I believe subscriptions can help bridge the access to justice gap and incentivize attorneys to modernize and scale their practice like never before. On this show, I interview lawyers ditching the billable hour and experts who can help attorneys move beyond billing time. Thanks to my sponsors, 650 and Gavel. Links to both in the show notes. More on them later. And use the code Law Subscribed when signing up. You get 10% off, and it supports the show. The best way to support the show is to share it with someone you know. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing said is legal, ethical, or financial advice. Without further delay, here's the episode. I'm thrilled to have with me here today Dr. Megan Ma. Welcome to the Law Subscribed podcast. Hi, thank you, Matthew. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Megan. I'm the Assistant Director at the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, or many of you know as Codex. The whole goal behind our research center is legal empowerment through information technology. So I kind of subscribe to that message as well. And a lot of my work is about building technology for law and specifically my focus since the sort of onset of generative AI has been, how do we actually leverage the tools in a way that accounts for its limitation, accounts for its risks, but also can help bolster and train the legal profession into kind of this next era. So, yeah. So, I mean, already my my listeners are going to be on the edge of their seats or their bike or whatever they're doing while they're listening to this podcast. (laughs) Just if you're cooking, just be careful with the the knife. So, so I I discovered you through a presentation you were doing with, with Damien Real, where you were talking on the subject. Longtime listeners know he was episode 57 of the podcast. And we had a really great conversation around Gen AI and the future of legal with with Damien. So high bar, Megan, but I know you could you could pass it because uh, I did watch that talk and I'm sure Damien would agree. But before we even get into the the really interesting stuff, let's just lay the groundwork a little bit more for like for your background, what brought you to Codex and like why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. So actually Codex is such a special place for me because I've been looking at it since I was doing my PhD. I was always seen as a little bit of an oddball. So my work is incredibly interdisciplinary. My background was in law and linguistics, actually. So I've always had an affinity for natural language and understanding kind of how humans, you know, generate or communicate thought through language. And I think the background around my PhD was, you know, as we enter into a world of automation and people are using computer code to write the law, are there going to be translation issues? A lot of people think that, you know, language shapes thought to an extent. And so if the legal language, which is inherently human, has shaped legal thought, what happens when we kind of make that transition into computer code? And there are obviously these restrictions. And how do you reconcile some of those differences? And I think when I initially pitched this thesis, only my supervisor thought it was remotely interesting. Everyone was like, she's a mad scientist. And over time, kind of, I had looked into what are relevant research centers that might think I am still a mad scientist, but maybe a little less. And I obviously came across Codex. And I think that the work that um, they've always been doing is how do you actually make the legal profession more efficient, more accessible? And actually, how do you imagine the future partners of the world? Um, And so That's kind of how I came into it. I started as a fellow and then shortly after I kind of took on this permanent position. I mean, what, what an incredible focus to have almost prescient uh, with like where (laughs) we are today with, with Gen AI and natural language, just in how we interface with technology. One of my, one of the things I like to talk about with Gen AI and how in the past with, with legal, with law firms, legal service providers, you have like these, I mean, let's be honest, old white men who like don't want to like change the way anything is done. And that's this is why legal technology, there's a hard time getting it adopted at these firms that are run by these, you know, closed minded people who don't want to have to learn how to do a new thing. But when you're communicating with it using the same way you communicate with other people, Mm -hmm. it's like the barrier to use anyway is so lowered that it really opens up this opportunity for adoption, even by the old crotchety lawyers who don't want to use all the fancy legal tech because it's just natural language. So it's really mm-hmm. unbelievable, like the the potential. I mean, there's still an adoption curve, I think, that we have to go on. Uh, but that's really something. I mean, those are just 
I mean, thoughts that I have in light of your, your expertise. But also, I'm very excited because I didn't know that coming into this. And my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. <laughs> and it was a focus on philosophy of language. And so oh, okay. we, we actually might have a lot even more to talk about, <laughs> but, uh, but that, <laughs> that might be the subject for a different podcast. I don't know. So <laughs> bringing it back to the theme, like what, like even like before I still want to, before Gen AI came out, you know, and you, you had this thesis, like, like what was happening in, in your world and what, what advancements did you see before this, this revolutionary uh, advent of, of Gen AI? Yeah. So. While I was undergoing some of my research, a lot of it was focused on this interest or sudden interest in domain-specific languages for law. How do we kind of find ways to leverage good old-fashioned AI and use formal logic? Because a lot of people have viewed that the legal structure and the way that legal texts were structured was very logical and that there was a logical backbone, um, as some might say. But a lot of what I think lawyers will joke around about is, well, everything, it depends. And, you know, there's all these questions around interpretation. And actually, people adored the stickiness of natural language. They like the flexibility. And especially when it comes to context of negotiation, actually, sometimes intentional ambiguity has a lot of benefit to it. And so my focus was on, can we build tools that better detect the ways in which we're using language in the law? And if we are able to identify some of that stickiness, then we know exactly the points in which we can very formally automate those tasks using good old fashioned AI or symbolic AI. And when we would have to think about another option or when we would have to preserve that humanity into it. And I think what was fascinating to me was that to your point earlier, legal tech was kind of this interesting space where I think lawyers knew that there were inefficiencies and inherently issues with the profession, but they sort of just viewed it as, well, all of this technology is sort of like a rocket engine that we're trying to retrofit into like a horse and carriage situation. Mm -hmm. And so it totally. just seems like there was no place there. And, you know, there was, it was really hard. And some of it was that I spent all this time perfecting how I wanted to use Microsoft Word or all these li little formatting nuances why would I, you know, like, that's all wasted time then? And the answer is, well, yes, it is wasted time. So why isn't there a better way? And I think with generative AI, suddenly, and I've come to now view it as a little bit of a double-edged sword as well, but the use of chat bots as the kind of medium to increase accessibility and perhaps even adoption, it A, kind of, open the eyes of lawyers that they don't have to see the kind of nuts and bolts anymore. They have like a very different entry point and that to be able to query in a way that it's like almost speaking with another colleague, that is really exciting. But the kind of, you know, downside to that is this new X of a chat bot was almost viewed as like an Oracle, right? I can always find what I need now and things like that. And I think that presentation is what's leading to, you know, still today, like, like lawyers using kind of chat GBT and getting hallucinations. And so that's sort of how I think the state at which we're at. But I think if we think thoroughly and we understand the foundations of this technology, then we know kind of exactly the use cases that they lend themselves well to and where we need to think about using maybe hybrid models, perhaps going back to our symbolic AI. Um, or when we just simply defer that to humans because we still have so much control over the profession. There are so many ways I could take this, but I just came <laughs> up with an idea and I want to I wanna run it by you. So I've, I've written about trying to educate lawyers and talked about with people on the podcast about how you can't rely on AI as a source of truth. But I really like your categorizing it as like they come to it as an oracle. So I'm thinking about calling it <laughs> inspiration from you the AI oracle fallacy, because <laughs> it's not, it's not an oracle. It's not a source of truth, but these are how some lawyers and just other people are, are treating it, right? So what, what do you think about that? A, the AI oracle fallacy. I adore that. Um, I mean, I think like sometimes I go between oracle and the other side of it is like a confessional. It's just because it's like in this like black kind of screen, depending on what mode you're in. And then you just type kind of questions and it gives you answers. And you just get this illusion 
that it's sharing you information that should be factual, but clearly it's not. And to be honest, like sometimes when we talk to humans, we don't necessarily know if all of those are facts either. So it's just funny that sometimes the UI UX has that type of significance and impact to the way that we respond and characterize things. Yeah, even the term hallucination implies that it should know better when it doesn't. <laughs> When, well, yeah, when humans just make something up, you know, they just made it up. It's not, did you call that a hallucination or did you just make something up, you know, based on mm -hmm. your aggregated knowledge as your brain is mm -hmm. processing it and you can't quite have a factual statement or you can't draw on a fact, so you just make something up. I wouldn't right. call it a hallucination unless you're supposed to know the answer. So it's really interesting. Also, fellow dark mode user here too. I don't know if, <laughs> if like, is, is there not a dark mode for ChatGPT and these other tools? I didn't even know if there was a, a regular. Mode. I think they still allow for a selection in light mode, which to me is so harsh on my eyes. So I would never use it. I, I know. I know. But my first, I, I, I alpha and beta test like a lot of legal tech. And my first request is always, please, dark mode, please. <laughs> they like, they never launch in dark mode. So one of the solutions though, is uh, to this like or this AI oracle fallacy is uh, retrieval augmented generation, right? Mm -hmm. Rag. So we've talked a little bit about that with Damien, but like we just barely scratched the surface. Like, what have you seen in terms of usage of Rag to overcome this problem? Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing I've been thinking about a lot is actually a lot of these tools have started to extend their context windows. For example, Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro now has that one million context window. Yes. And so the question here that what we're, we've been thinking about, so some of the earlier tools or the ones that are the earliest adopters like co-counsel, they use RAG. It plugs directly into the existing database that they already have and the way that they've already structured their data. But what's new is sort of this tension between like, do we need longer context windows or do we need RAG? And when it comes down to it, we've seen sort of multiple dimensions where we've seen it based on costs. We've seen it based on actually consistency of retrieval. But what's funny is that repeatedly people tend to think about only accuracy as that one dimension. So people are saying the longer the context window, there's still kind of better accuracy of retrieval. But why kind of retrieval augmented generation still, you know, in some cases there's very much a benefit to it is because of this notion of consistency that you can almost better curtail mm -hmm. how the model is going to respond to you. I think with a co bigger context window, you still can't entirely accommodate for the fact that it may not produce the exact same answers every time. And that's a serious limitation of these models. I don't think that we're going to ever reach necessarily a stage where it's going to be 100% reproducibility, but at least with RAG, I think that that is the major um, benefit to it. Even humans, though, with photographic memory are an anomaly, right? And so like, mm -hmm. like, like getting the same answer from a human being every single time with the same question is a rarity in the exact mm -hmm. same way. So I wonder if it's even, you know, if, if, if the resources that would have to go into that are even worth it. Which makes me think, everything you're saying makes me think of how some of the best advancements that we've had in our technology is when we look at nature and like, let's see how, <laughs> na you know, millions of years of evolution have already solved this, a natural selection have already solved this problem. Maybe we learn from that and apply it to mm -hmm. our technology. And, and that's, I've, I've seen some, and, and, you know, I'm just a user of the tech and I follow it and I read up on it, but like, I don't understand like, like the deeper science and mechanics of like, of, of AI engineering and such. But I've been reading some stuff on how they're they're trying to have like these AI models like go to sleep and have like a REM like state in terms of processing mm -hmm. or something. And and <laughs> and so your your question of rag versus larger context windows makes me think, how does how does the human mind work? And mm -hmm. and do we have like which one takes precedent over the other for how we use our brain? <laughs> like do we have larger context mm -hmm. windows or or are we are we retrieving particular pieces of knowledge that we've that we've retained when we're when we're having a conversation right and i don't know uh, i'm not sure which one is maybe more important what do you think i think well i think it depends i think when we're in a pinch 
we're a longer context window type person mm -hmm. or type human where like we just need to process all the information at once and do it quickly. And so we might have needle in the haystack type discussions where we read the beginning, we read the end and some of the stuff gets lost in the middle. But when we have the time, I think we figure out how to break information down into more palpable pieces. We might use different ways to kind of structure the information that we were given. And so I think just as models, you can choose your technique of enabling better retrieval. Humans do the same thing. And I think it's funny that you're, we think a lot about these technologies as becoming very close to the way nature takes, nature sort of plays out. To me, I always think about how can we actually do almost the opposite of leveraging the comparative strengths of machine and humans? I think there's, there's still flavors of what we're trying to discover as inherently human, but at least for now, we know that these machines are capable of processing information at incredibly high velocity and high volume. And I think that that's something that they will always succeed in relative to humans. And so I think this era, as we're starting to enter into the next phase, what I call the maturity phase of using these tools, we're really thinking about these comparative advantages so that we have a better sense of what our workflow and how our workflow can be augmented using these tools. Yeah, that, that reminds me of something that the CEO of Grammarly said on a podcast where he looks at AI, as we're calling it, like artificial intelligence, more as augmented intelligence. Now, of course, mm -hmm. Grammarly incorporates AI now heavily into their, their, their tool, but that's how he's thinking about it. And I really do like that reframing. I mean, AI, artificial intelligence is almost more like a marketing term now than actually like a, mm -hmm. a, a proper descriptive term of what it does. You know, now mm -hmm. we have to have, you know, a, there's GAI, Gen AI, and then there's AGI, right. which is artificial general intelligence, which is maybe more mm -hmm. of what we think of when we think of, you know, sci-fi AI. Mm -hmm. But is it, I, you know, what are your thoughts on, on his perspective of AI as it is now, generative AI, is really more augmented intelligence as it relates to the brain, which goes back to what you were saying, like our brains can never process that amount of information. So really it's, mm -hmm. it's more augmenting our intelligence than it is its own separate artificial intelligence. Great. I think I'm probably with him there, but augmentation can only happen if we actually have a better sense of our sort of relative strengths and weaknesses. I think one thing that I always see is there's now co-pilots as the go-to term around integrating generative AI. But the truth is, is that we haven't always worked in a co-pilot fashion. We work collaboratively, but you know, the points at which we collaborate are very different than the way they're trying to frame co-pilot as like a kind of marketing term for use of generative AI. They might say, you know, these processes, you know, you can do faster, but, you know, not everyone constantly needs to search through their emails in a perfect fashion or kind of retrieve that information very quickly. So I think until we're able to understand not only the expectations that people have of how we conduct our own work, being able to augment really relies on actually a deeper understanding of ourselves in the profession. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a, it's a really important point. So let's, I, I want to ask you before we just get totally lost in the weeds here, because the podcast is called Lost Subscribed and we're trying to talk about, I want to try to frame this conversation now around the inefficiencies in the law and how most private practice attorneys are billing their time. You know, looking at your experience uh, here, I, I, I'm not. This does. I don't really know the answer to this question, and that is: is did you ever have to bill your time? Oh, um, yes, I did, but okay. very, very briefly. T um, tell us about that. I had worked very briefly for a law firm, so that was pretty much the quintessential experience of you know submitting billable hours. To be honest, I was very confused on how to even articulate the work that I was trying to say, like, or what work exactly was done and how do I'm supposed to be able to calculate that. And so I think that some of the understanding of the operations of the law firm, I, I kind of like lost actually, even with billable hours, you're supposed to just like punch in, you know, your time as if you know exactly, you know how to capture the time that you spent on it, but actually it's not very clear and it's much more subjective. 
Um, and so we know, I think, as humans, the end goal of what we're trying to achieve, or at least the intermediary milestones. But to be able to actually capture these almost meta tasks or subtasks in between and be able to bill on those, I think that that seems to be rather murky, at least to me. But yeah, yeah. and there and there are, I, I think, I think there are so many ethical, like legal, eth like like attorney ethical quandaries with with billing time and the ethics rules you know depends on the jurisdiction but they're they're ripe with like cautionary tales about don't use wasteful procedures to bill your clients the fee has to be reasonable right and is you know not using all the advanced technology that we have you know is that and and, and billing on that accordingly is that unreasonable you know is that a wasteful procedure to not do that I think the answer is yes, but just we haven't seen any clients of lawyers like filing complaints with the licensing bodies about you know <laughs> using wasteful procedures because they don't know legal ethics. Mm -hmm. They don't know professional responsibility rules. Only the lawyers know. And it, it, it's fascinating to hear how you described it as, you know, you were confused on like how to articulate it because we all are when we stop to go bill <laughs> hours for the first time. They don't teach that to you in law school. And, and the few, the very few law schools that try to prepare attorneys for private practice and even starting their own firms, which are few, they, they talk about alternative business models too. Like they just, they don't just teach billing time. So, mm -hmm. so it is one of these things where it doesn't make any sense because also from a business perspective, how, like, I, okay, so just how long I work on it, like means that that's valuable. Like, not like you said, like you think <laughs> about, we humans, we think about the outcome. Well, that's something mm -hmm. that I could think about. Maybe I could assign a value to that, but there's all this dogma mm -hmm. around how long does it take you know, for, to, to build time. So Great. Go, oh, go ahead. I'll, let's get your thoughts on that. And then I'll, I'll follow up. I just thought, it, well, it just reminded me actually, you know, a partner that I spoke to about how the billable hours basically just showcasing how lawyers have to be the perfect amount of inefficient. And I thought that that was really funny in terms of how he articulated it, because, you know, to an extent, it does. Everyone knows it disincentivizes the use of technology because you can do things at a much more efficient and maybe accurate and consistent rate, depending on the tools that you're using here. But we don't necessarily want to showcase some of that. I mean, I've seen obviously these alternative billing models where you can bill like one and a half if you use technology. But something that actually I spoke with Damien about is are we able to think about a new duty of competence or reframe or add to the duty of competence that is more similar to a doctor who part of, you know, that standard of care is to ensure that you are familiar with the latest tools. We don't have that in the legal profession. We always kind of are, it's almost like technology is entirely rid of the discussion in, you know, what is professional conduct? When in the medical profession, it's deeply grounded in being able to stay abreast of new technology. So, yeah. It's an, it's an excellent point. And it's one that I've talked about with other people before, which is, yes, we have a duty of competence in the use of the technology that we're using. We don't have a duty <laughs> to be competent in current technology and use it, yes. which is a big <laughs> difference. And yeah. it's, it's kind of wild. You know, only lawyers would come up with a rule like that that allows them to like you know, it's just like how, how when, when we adopted judicial ethics, it was everywhere but the Supreme Court, <laughs> you know. Right. <laughs> Only the lawyers will find out a way to both sound like they're doing something good without actually doing the thing. And it's no wonder we have, a, you know, this, uh, that potential clients uh, have the opinions of, of the legal profession that they do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think some of that comes down to I don't know how much it's going to cost, uh, which goes back to the billable mm -hmm. hour. E even, even contingency, you know, okay, so it doesn't cost you anything. Well, that's not true, right? Because mm -hmm. it costs you a third of whatever you were going to win or whatever right. percentage you've agreed mm -hmm. and whatever liens if it's personal injury. So like there's actually mm -hmm. a huge cost. Like you might only be walking away with a third yourself of whatever, you know, the damages that are awarded. So mm -hmm. I, I think that having certainty and cost may, play, plays a big role. Mm -hmm. So at, at Codex, just in case my listeners don't know what Codex is, like give us like a quick like primer on like what is Codex? Yeah, sure. So Codex or the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, we're a research center that is a joint initiative between the law school and the department of CS at Stanford. Um, our whole idea, it's housed in the law school. So unlike other research centers, we don't do 
law of X, like law economics or law of technology. We are the opposite. We build technology for law. So our whole idea and a lot of our research and even the potential sort of sometimes startups that come out of Codex is centered on how do we actually take a look at the existing pain points across the legal system and brainstorm whether or not technology is a possible solution. It's not that we necessarily assert that technology is always the solution. Our whole idea is where is it or where are these existing pain points working very closely with industry or other sort of practitioners to be able to capture, you know, this actually is a problem that can be solved very easily with whatever suite of technologies that we think about. Mm -hmm. that, that, gosh, that must be so hard, though, like in terms of like if I will like just do some of the things they don't require lawyer adoption, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it would be impossible to make any progress in advancing technology and law if it required the lawyers to use it, right? Based on what we were just saying earlier. So like, what are some of the things that you've seen come through Codex that maybe could be implemented without lawyers having to be the, the users of it? Well, it's actually interesting because some of our closest partners are lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so some of the tools that we are building at this stage, at least from my perspective, is a strong focus actually around legal education and legal training of lawyers. So I am sure you've heard, but m many lawyers are still incredibly hesitant about using generative AI for end product uses. So even if you're drafting a contract, it is for sure just a draft. And most of the time, it takes a lot of senior lawyers to go through the editing of it. But when it comes to alternative uses, Many partners actually express that anything that they could do to make the operating system or, you know, the business operations of a law firm more efficient or to make the training of lawyers more fruitful, especially because, you know, this new suite of tools is going to change the way that we prioritize certain skills or not. How do we actually go through the right training? And I always talk about how in a law school, we're not actually taught any of those practical skills you need in practice. There is a huge gap between a law school graduate and then entering into the workforce for the first time. And so the things that we try to work on is how do we minimize that gap or at least bridge some of that gap? And, you know, for a first year associate, how do we get them to go from I'm just diving into the deep end or it being a baptism by fire to be able to ramp up quickly. And so a lot of our tools are thinking about how do we simulate things in practice? So almost like a fighter pilot simulation. So rather than, you know, actually flying the plane for the first time ever, like day one of the job, you're going through a series of practical simulations. So that's a little bit about some of the projects that we're working on right now. But many of the sort of other areas within our center that we've been thinking about is Insurance is also a big consideration for us. One of our biggest partners is a big insurer. And we're leveraging tools that are more in the space of symbolic AI or good old-fashioned AI. The idea there is that insurance is one of those products that people purchase but don't have a very clear idea of what exactly they're purchasing. And so how do you actually disentangle some of that information around coverage and exclusions? And this is particularly difficult when you have a whole portfolio or a whole series of policies that you purchase. So how do you actually compare across your policies so that you know when there is a gap and when there might be overlap? So you can not only save money on if there is overlap, but also if there is a gap, then you know you need to protect against that risk. So those, yeah, those are some small examples. When I went solo, I pivoted from mostly litigation to a transactional only practice. I did not have a database of documents to automate. That's why a business and employment legal document database and automation tool like 650 is super useful. I can rely on the quality of the documents in 650's database since they're putting excellent legal minds to work curating and updating their documents and automations over time. When you're not billing by the hour, outsourcing and efficiency matters and 650 can help you scale your practice to get high quality documents drafted in less time. Use the code LAWSUBSCRIBED at 650 
Bonds50.com and when being onboarded to get 10% off. If you're not a business and employment attorney or you have your own documents that you'd prefer to use, then my next sponsor, Gavel, is the automation tool for you. Gavel allows you to build shareable, client-facing workflow and document automations. In other words, Gavel helps you create a legal practice where attorneys can monetize the value they bring clients in productized form and scale via subscriptions and flat fees. Use the code LAWSUBSCRIBED at gavel.io to get 10% off an annual subscription. There's no one right way to automate and scale your practice, but with one or both of my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, you can take your subscription law firm to the next level. Links to both in the show notes. Now back to the show. Uh, I mean, as a former insurance defense attorney, like I, like we could really go down a rabbit hole there. That's super interesting. And, and also there are like sometimes if you buy something with a credit card, you may have insurance covering like right. the, the travel or something. And so there's like a lot right. of potential for overlapping insurance and being overinsured as a consumer. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I wonder, can, can we just plug these insurance policies into a Gen AI tool and like we could use natural language to query them as consumers, you know, of, the, of these policies? <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe plug them all in, use RAG, here are all my policies, P- you know, please identify for me where I have overlapping coverage. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I feel like and I'm glad you brought up insurance, though, that we're not going to go down the specifics of the insurance route. But in terms of insurance companies being able to cut costs, which then they could pass on the savings to the subscribers to the insurance products. Right now, when there's claims and they have to hire outside counsel, there are some, there's some flat fee work, like examinations under oath, but a lot of it is billable time. And these are oftentimes negotiated down billable rates for volume-based practices. But there's so much data. And having been an insurance defense attorney when I was developing the subscription model for legal services, I was leveraging that data to come up with a great subscription plus flat fee model that would eliminate the need to have departments dedicated to figuring out, was this work actually billable? With which they spend a lot of resources on that. (laughs) And yet they have such sunk costs into that you know, it's, look, it's a lot of people's jobs. I think they could be doing other work for the insurance company, maybe profit generating work instead of cost mm-hmm. savings work. And, and they, they have KPIs around all that stuff. And so like it would just disappear. And so how do we get past that? And I don't know. I'm just curious about your perspective since you said you're working with insurance companies. Like how do we get them past these sunk costs? Like the sunk cost fallacy of, well, we have all these people. They, like we have all these KPIs of reducing outside counsel, billable fees. If they could budget for exactly how long, exactly how much the case was going to cost on subscription and flat fee. And they could be incentivized to, if they send more cases to a firm, that monthly subscription cost goes down, right? Because the firms want more files. They're going to be used leveraging tools like AI and automations to automate pleadings and discovery responses and discovery production and all that stuff. So they're incentivized to like get cases done faster now and get more cases. And so like the subscription and flat fee model can seriously revolutionize insurance defense high volume work, but the insurance companies don't want to do it. Why? (laughs) Well, insurance companies, I think more than lawyers are incredibly risk averse. Even the people that they hire are incredibly risk averse. And I think that there is no real external like threat around technology for them. I think that they are big enough (laughs) that they just can absorb those costs and don't really see any incentive behind it. But I will say that your point about the subscription model or this flat fee, we've seen that with quite a few boutique law firms and one that we work very, very closely with. That's actually behind why they've been adopting so much technology, how they've built a bunch of technology in-house as well. And so there's actual empirical evidence that you're definitely kind of lowering costs there. You're definitely making costs of service much more transparent as well. But on the other hand, you're actually making your own work and your own efforts a lot easier. Um, I think right now you're almost prioritizing the grunt work and kind of almost making it glorified because you think that that's a rite of passage. But I think at the end of the day, if you realize that you can almost make the most out of your profession, get to the level of more highly analytical work and eliminate some of those, you know, menial tasks that you have to do in between. 
your actual lawyering duties, so to speak, then you will, I think, will be arriving at a much more fulfilled sense of our careers. Absolutely. You know, that taps into the whole discussion over attorney wellness and substance abuse in the profession. I mean, we have like agencies, like the legal assistance program, like dedicated to helping lawyers with like substance abuse and mental health problems. And I think a lot of it, I mean, not not all of it, but I think a lot of it comes from like, I, I have to build my time. It's the only way I make money. I'm prioritizing these things that are not fulfilling tasks for me, nor like, and there's this cognitive disconnect. Going back to what mm -hmm. you said earlier, we're like, it's not even tied to anything of value. Like it's not even, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the outcome was. It's just like, how much time right. did I spend on the thing? And I think, I think that that plays a large role in attorney wellness and that it's not great. Mm -hmm. But it's really important that you mentioned that. And, and I do want to learn more about this firm that, you know, using alternative business models. We'll talk about that later. And I, I'd love to have them on the show if they want to come. Are you seeing any other law firms uh, doing innovative things or alternative legal service providers that are coming in to disrupt the, the billable hour? So maybe not necessarily the billable hour, though I'm starting to see quite a number of startups um, tackle this space using generative AI. I think many of you probably know and many of your subscribers probably hear that I think that contract generation space and like anything kind of related to traditional legal research and using generative AI for it, it's getting quite saturated. But people are still tapping into the potential of generative AI. And so a lot of newer, more, I think, occasionally interesting startups are thinking about the law firm's operating system and going into, you know, what does the, what do billables actually share about, you know, how our revenue models have been historically? And I think all the data that you use to make your own subscription plan, that was really informative for you, how like your practice has played out. And so I think that there's quite a few startups that are thinking about this space, at least. But when it comes to, I think, innovations internal to a law firm, I think many law firms have started AI practices. For example, we work very closely with DLA Piper, and they're doing a lot of work in AI auditing and red teaming. And I think that that's very interesting to kind of have almost a forensic type uh, tactile practice that's internal to a law firm. So law firms are known for the advisory component. But in addition to advice, you're also giving like practical guidance on what to do next. So I think that that's quite interesting as well. But I wonder if that team at DLA Piper, after they clear an AI tool, if they then turn around and are, are using it to make their work more efficient. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean that, well, they have, I think, separate teams around red teaming versus okay. deployment of yeah, technology. Yeah. But yeah, I think they definitely do go hand in hand. And I and there's even more sort of interesting startups that are working on risk mitigation. So like building guardrails and how do you actually curtail some of those outputs or validate whether those outputs are consistent with what your stakeholders expect. We're starting to see so many more startups kind of emerge in this space. And I certainly think that law firms are thinking about that as well. Yeah. So, so some, some ideas that I have for the way that law firms can integrate Gen AI into their practice in the future. Um, well, first of all, I think like we've already sort of touched on, like it's all going to make work more efficient and billing your time isn't going to make, it's just not going to be the most profitable way you could have a business model, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, things are not going to take very long, but the value is still there. Right. But one of the things that I've been looking at, and I'm, I'm curious to know what you've seen you know, come through the center, but also just in, in your other research into this area. And that is like how difficult it will be in the future to just train your own large language model. I know there's one, there's one startup uh, that was just at ABA Tech Show that they, unlike every other AI company there that's doing like APIs with, with chat, with open AI, mostly all of them are with open AI. Some of them are using Anthropics uh, models mm -hmm. and, and some of these other models. But one is doing their own, they're, they're training their own large language model specific to law. And they call it their, like a, a law language model or a legal language model or something like that, right? So they're like training a whole model on it. So I wonder if we're going to be seeing more of that or if we're going to be using like foundational models that we're going to train on top of, like like the ease of which you think we'll be able to start doing this in the future. Because law firms that have a knowledge base or all this data that can be you know, client stuff can be stripped and then trained and then anonymized. Like, I feel like there's mm -hmm. massive opportunity to have like your own mm -hmm. either internal firm for like all the staff and the lawyers to use, but then mm -hmm. also an external facing tool as a subscriber benefit. 
for clients to use. There's some stuff that's kind of out there that, but they all integrate with like OpenAI and some other, some of these other tools. So like, like how long do you think until that future? I know I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball here, so we're not going to hold you <laughs> to it. Don't worry. But, but how, how long do you think, or like, are these tools out there? I just haven't really quite found them yet. Or how long do you think until this becomes a, a feasible reality for lawyers to restructure the way they deliver legal services? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I'm curious whether or not the model that you're talking about is the K3LM that was released by 273 Ventures and Dan Katz and Michael Bomarito. I think they released that about two two days ago or something like that. Um, Did they announce it at the at the AI summit that they just had on Friday? I don't know. No, it, it's Paxton. Paxton AI is is the, the oh okay the, the startup that is that's trading their own model. I mean, I'll have to look into this K3LM. You said yeah. yeah. So I think it's so. First of all, I think the question is really fascinating because you're basically showcasing actually just how legal tech startups are interested in almost building wrappers and applications on top of these existing sort of powerful state-of-the-art models. And, you know, something I've been thinking about a lot is actually the role of terms of service agreements. So as, you know, a legal tech or legal gen AI product, you have to think about the terms of use and you have to write terms of service that are incredibly product specific. But when there is harm or when something goes wrong, you know, what's what does the indemnification look like? And have you negotiated with OpenAI in advance what that what that liability looks like? And I think that that is maybe a bigger concern than actually, you know, training the model. And and I think when it comes to questions of, you know, is it better to just train the model from the ground up, so to speak? I don't think we have actually a benchmark even on what the relative performance is. And I think that that's what we will need in order to be able to answer these questions more concretely. Right now, we don't. Act, we know that these models can do things. We know that they are able to perform. For example, a Stanford sort of cross department studied legal bench. We basically threw TAS at GPT four, and we said, "Can you do this?" And it could, but we don't know actually how well it does it relative to a lawyer and at what stage in their career. And so one one thing that we're trying to work on right now, at least at Codex, is we're trying to build a benchmark to say, you know, given certain parameters, we're going to feed it to GPT-4. And then we're also going to have a human lawyer at this level of experience, given one hour and these resources, how does it perform relatively? And I think beyond that, we need to understand, you know, if we train a model and we say it's a legal large language model from the ground up, does it actually perform better and more accurately than than, you know, just building the wrapper. And there are some kind of announcements and discussion that, yeah, like it does perform better, but I think there needs to be an external, maybe academic party that goes into that and digs into how well these models perform against each other. And for what tasks, like what types of tasks, there's a huge diversity of legal tasks and we don't define very well what is a legal task. And so until we get to sort of these stages, then we can better clarify exactly, you know, not only what types of tasks these models should be used, like working on, but also when to use a model that's trained from the ground up and when we can continue using one that's not built on a wrapper. So, right. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, we'll, we'll see. Like, even from the very beginning, I was thinking, I wonder if there's a product here for like an LLM in a box that you could like <laughs> give to a law firm to train on its data. Of course, then the law firm mm -hmm. data is a mess. So there's also an opportunity to like go in mm -hmm. and tag all law firm data, right? For like just right. like for startups. I mean, I'm a practicing lawyer. Right. I have a podcast. I'm a true solo. Like I'm not going to do that. But it's fun to think about these opportunities. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think I think there is something there. And at least anecdot anecdotally for me, I've demoed and used actively a lot of these tools, most of them connecting to OpenAI. And... Paxton has blown them away. So I don't know what they're doing. And they're not lawyers. Like a lot of these other places are like, there's like a lawyer co-founder. They just brought in a, a lawyer to help with developing the product. So they were not, they were like scientists, you know, like, like they're not like they're experts in the other things mm -hmm. and engineers, you know, they're not, they weren't, so they didn't have the, the functional fixedness, I think, of mm -hmm. the way lawyers think about things when they came in. I mean, they had done things in conjunction with lawyers, they, they weren't um, oblivious to it. They were building a legal AI tool, but they never 
never plugged in with OpenAI's API. And, and, I, and ChatGPT4 Turbo is amazing, mm -hmm. but it's not as good as at the legal stuff. So it's, it's, I, I think mm -hmm. anecdotally, from my experience, mm -hmm. um, I think there's something there. And I think listeners should think about that. So, because we do have some, uh, like it's mostly a lawyer audience mm -hmm. that listens to the podcast, but um, right. they're already entrepreneurial because they're thinking about ditching the billable hour. And we have a lot of right. legal tech founders that do tune in. So I want to make sure, we, you know, you know they, they listen up. As we start to wrap up the interview here, I mean, I have a couple more questions for you, but I'm just like, like, is there anything else that's coming to mind for you that like you think is like really important that lawyers should think about when it comes to Gen AI? I think as something that Damien and I were talking about is we'll start, we'll need to start thinking about as well, how to like take advantage or leverage multimodal models as well, or maybe, you know, how to think about say integrating AI agents into some of our work. Right now, we just view, you know, AI as independent tools, but what about AI as a service? And some of the things that I've been working on, for example, with John Nay, who started Norm AI is how do we use AI agents for a supervisory role or a regulatory role where they, in theory, ingest all of the specific regulations in a particular domain and then act as almost the triaging tool. Uh, it's like the nurse practitioners, for example, in the early days, or, you know, some of these medical triaging tools like Babylon Health, for example, to get a better scope. And then it redirects to a human for additional review. And so I think that what we're hoping to see this year is how we're able to leverage multiple models at once, more dynamicism in kind of different models, like multimodal models. There's like the infamous tweet that I always talk about where, you know, there's a very complicated parking sign where no one knows when it's the right time to park. And, you know, your vision was able to kind of reason that and provide you a quick response that could be really helpful when it comes to questions of access to justice. Or maybe an insurance where you where you're gone through a collision or some sort of incident, and you can take a picture and determine whether or not you're covered. Oh um, yeah, that would be revolutionary. Yeah. So I mean, that's some of the things that I I don't know started to brainstorm. And, and the smart cars are going to collect the data and immediately put it into the multimodal model, right? Like like mm -hmm. all so much there could be so much more data that can be processed by these models. It's not yeah. just you know I take a picture of it. It's like you know, the cars are connected to, like, it's all connected to the internet now, and maybe mm -hmm. it all plugs in. So you don't have to hire the experts, and that reduces the cost of litigation mm -hmm. and claims processing and everything. You know, you have to account for bias, obviously. Yes. You'll get some human eyes on that at a certain point mm -hmm. to account for bias. Yeah. But I feel like that's going to help with access to justice massively. I think that's a great mm -hmm. point. And, and also, as far as the signs are concerned, maybe we could use these these multi-model things to say like, okay, I need an image that says this. And it's like a less confusing image, like like a blank right. parking thing. So maybe we, yeah. we, we eliminate the problem on the front end instead of having to solve it with AI on the back end. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, man. I mean, you raise a really brilliant point here where it's like we always think about how these tools are working with our existing infrastructure and our existing world. But we're not looking at like the other direction where it's like, well, over time, there's going to be adjustments naturally. And I love to analogize with self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles. So I'm glad you brought that up because one of the considerations, I worked actually briefly in the Canadian government and in the Ministry of Transportation. I was in the working group for autonomous vehicles. And one of the things that we were asked is, is the future that we just don't have parking lots because these cars are almost like taxiing services. So there won't be as much of a need for ownership because you can just call rideshare everywhere if we reach a certain level of safety. So in the same way, kind of what I'm seeing is we obviously think about the interaction at this stage and what are those modes of interaction, but we don't think about kind of the reverse direction of, you know, how do we actually ultimately reimagine the legal architecture or legal infrastructure? I think so much about that and how it's not even going to be <laughs> rideshare, right? It's going to be a subscription to a certain mm -hmm. tier of niceness of vehicle that I press a button, it shows up at my door, whether I'm in a condo or an apartment or a single family home, right? And I don't even need a garage anymore. Like, I, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think parking, parking garages are going anywhere because those might actually be like where the cars go to, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, like it'll go to a parking place right. and you'll, you'll get, you might get a different car every time unless you wanted to pay a premium for a subscription <laughs> add-on. But right. the subscription model plays really well in that future. 
And, and I think, I, I, and I've, I've envisioned that future as well. So good, now I know I'm not crazy. And there are actually like <laughs> places that are, like there, there is a, a government entity in Canada actually thinking about this future. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how much they're thinking about it anymore, but, you know, <laughs> it was in the time of the heyday of the autonomous vehicle. We'll get there. And they were talking about insurance, actually. So yeah, there's also I mean, that. I, you know, car insurance, like, what, like, do you need individual that has an individual that has car insurance in that world? I don't think you do, right? It's going to look yeah. very different. It's going to look very, very different. Any other predictions since you mentioned artificial intelligence, or since you mentioned access to justice, that, that you see Gen AI and AI and law playing a role in, in access to justice or anything you're, you're seeing coming through the center related to that? So one of our sort of close friends and neighboring center, so the Legal Design Lab, which is run by Margaret Hagen, they're doing a lot of work. They're also setting up um, a policy practicum that is looking into AI and self-help or legal self-help. Um, also, I think them and Professor David Enstrom, they recently signed with the LA Superior Court to start integrating generative AI in the court. Um, so I think there's definitely developments there. But one of the key, I think, areas that's going to be quite interesting is right now it's almost like because access to lawyers is incredibly difficult, 80% of people on average don't get access to a lawyer. It's almost like you have two paths. Either you go down this like click rabbit hole in a self-help site and then you kind of arrive at a non-answer or you kind of go directly to ChatGBT, type in your question and get some semblance of legalese. And it's sort of mutually exclusive at the moment. And I think one thing that will be really interesting is if we're able to leverage sort of existing self-help information, tap into some of that database and maybe use reg and then build kind of a model where the everyday person can access. So you get the advantage of that chatbot, get the, you know, how quickly those, you know, chatbots are responding with a response and then actually figure out what next steps you need to take. And maybe then you'll be referred to say a legal aid center or, you know, some pro bono work. I know for a fact that this already exists. And the reason why I know, although I don't know that it's in use, but I, I get reached out to because I have Gen AI expert on my LinkedIn. I get a lot of Gen AI legal companies that are reaching out to me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And one of them just gave me like a loom of a demo of they did, mm -hmm. they, they put all of Illinois legal aid online.org into mm -hmm. this model that trained yeah. on it and then made a right. chat bot around it. So you could chat mm -hmm. with them. They were like, Hey, we could do this for your law firm. So I don't know if right. it's actually, and, and I played around with it. And then I, I searched on, I actually tested it on the website versus the search. And it seemed to like, cause it was using rag, like it was only pulling from mm -hmm. the website. Right. So right. It, it, it did it a pretty good job. And so like natural language versus having to search and click around, like you said, it can make a right. world of a difference, right? So now whether or not like they actually like told Illinois Legal Aid Online they were doing this, right. like, you know, it's a different story. <laughs> but but I've seen at least a beta version of this in practice. And, and it's it's the, the potential future for that is really fascinating. And it's a nonprofit. It's not directly affiliated with any Illinois courts. Um, right. But when I when, when like people need help with something that either I can't help them with or even my fees, which are really affordable, right? Twenty dollars a month, fifty dollars a page. Like if even I'm too expensive for them, and I don't do litigation stuff. I'll try to help avoid it or settle things for them. But if things end up in court, mm -hmm. you know, here's some litigation attorneys I know, or here's Illinois Legal Aid. Like I, I that's a resource I'm already sharing with potential or existing right. clients. So it's a really powerful thing. So then I'll just ask you the last question I ask all my guests, and that is. Is a hot dog a sandwich and why? Oh my goodness. That is one of my favorite questions. Actually, part of my PhD included that. <laughs> well then, let's hear it. <laughs> to, well, to me, I think it depends on which linguistic theory you subscribe to. So is it compositional or is it kind of prototype? And for me, I'm more of the prototype side as opposed to composition because I think it's in infinitely regressive to do that. And so I'd say, no, a hot dog is not a sandwich. Okay, I think there was reasoning in there, but we might not have enough time to go into it now. I will okay. say, so prototype is kind of like, if you imagine a bird, you don't immediately think of a penguin, you think of a robin. But if it's compositional theory, then you think about the parts that make up an, a thing. And there's so an infinite amount for, of parts down to string theory, down to quantum physics, down to- whatever. Exactly. So that's why it's regressive, okay. Yes, that makes so that's why sense. I subscribe to prototype theory. <laughs> I think I probably do too, although it's fun to go down that other rabbit hole. If people wanted to reach out to you or find you, what's the best way for mm -hmm. them to do that? 
just reach out to me via my email. It's public knowledge on the Stanford site. So it's Megan Ma at law.stanford.edu. I do want to follow up with you later about this law firm mm -hmm. and, and see anyone else who you might who might be a, a good to come on the show. But but for now, thanks so much for coming mm -hmm. on the podcast Law Subscribed. Yeah, thanks so much, Matthew. And that's our show. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for being sponsors. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with somebody you think would find value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, message me on LinkedIn or email kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed.